So would you say these or read those with me and uh, worship together? In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And would you continue to hear the word of the Lord as I read it to us, beginning in verse number 8, right there from verse 7. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. When the angels went away from there into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. May God bless the reading of his word. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we are so grateful and we are so blessed. We are merry with joy because in a world without hope, we have the great, great hope of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And you have come, Jesus, in the flesh. We anticipate, just as you came the first time, we look forward to your second coming for your return for us, your children. Even so, come quickly, Jesus. For you are everything for which we live. It's just not this day that we celebrate your birth. It's every day that we breathe. We recognize we have new life because you have given us freedom from our sin freedom from death, freedom from the devil through your victory upon the cross. Oh, Jesus, may this year be a year that we rejoice like the shepherds, praising and glorifying, so that people just stand back and wonder and say, what is it up with them? What is different? What joy they have that I don't. Lord, thank you that you come to humble people like us. Not many mighty are called. Not many wise. You've come to the humble and the lowly. And you've made yourself known to us, and for that we rejoice. Be with us in our our weakness, and we pray especially this morning for Doris Watson, God, that you would strengthen her 
and give her your healing. We pray as well for Helen Harry. God, that her mind and her strength would be set upon you. And Father, we also pray for the family of Betty Myers and ask God that you would be merciful to them in their time of grieving. Father, we thank you and we praise your name for your word. We ask that, Holy Spirit, you would illumine our minds that we would see Jesus, that we would love him even more than we have before, and that we would rejoice, glorifying, and praising you and serving you all of our days. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The youngest class is dismissed for Children's Church this morning. At this time, uh, the older class will stay with us. We will celebrate the Lord's Supper as we have been the last several weeks, coming forward to the Lord's table. Next Sunday, we will celebrate in our typical monthly fashion of it being distributed by the men and then we partaking of it together. And what a joy it has been to celebrate in this time of Advent and now Christmas, this very first day of the 12 days of Christmas, celebrating that Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is come. He is with us. And this story that we have been looking at throughout this time of Advent and even last night at Christmas Eve is a story that is hard to believe and fathom at first, especially as you begin to think that God himself, the very most high as we have seen him described, came as we saw last night, humble. There was no place for him. There was no hotel even. There was not even a castle or a kingship for him that was there to recognize him. It was a very lowly place with animals and rags, swaddling cloth. So much so that you and I would sit back and probably say, is this really the king? Is this, how can this be the son of God? Are you sure? Have we made a mistake? Is this the wrong address? And yet as we come to our passage this morning, We come away saying, how can this but not be the Son of God? I am always enamored with angels. Not like you see on shows. I think they're just ridiculous. I'm glad Touched by an Angel is gone. Uh, I don't even see reruns usually. If I did, that's, that's like torturing me. Put toothpicks and make me watch a movie like that or some show like that. I'm screaming because I, when I think of angels, I know that they can be angels that, uh, you know, we don't recognize, okay, as it says in the book of Hebrews. You know, we have entertained angels unaware. But most of the time when you see an angel revealed in his normality, not just, uh, you, you find people falling down on their face before them in great fear. I mean, I cannot imagine what that would be like. I, that would be like, well, you know, I was just like, okay, come on, Gabriel, lay it on me when I get to heaven someday. I want to I know what it felt like to be the shepherds out in the field, just tending their she- sheep, and all of a sudden, you appear to them. Let me know what that's like. Some have said about the live nativity, we had a lady come through this year, said, where are the angels? Well, I said, that's all of our women. No, no, I didn't say that. Actually, uh, what I, I said to them is this. I said, you know, <clears throat> if you really think about what takes place in this story, it'd be n- impossible for us to truly depict the angelic. Because we'd have to hand out new pairs of underwear after you got the experience. That's what it would be. It really would be. That's what it would be like. It would be horrific. You would be like, oh my goodness, I have just encountered a holy being. I mean, it would be a flash. Everyone in the whole place, you could not. It would be radiant everywhere. This lady told me, she says, oh, we were doing a live nativity, and we had the teenagers strapped up on the roof. <laughs> Don't worry, girls, I'll never do this to you. <laughs> that would be really funny. Uh, we bring you great news. <laughs> Don't worry, you're safe. The glory and the beauty, we need to use our imagination when we think of the angelic.
They are lower than God himself. They too, like us, fall in obeisance before God Almighty and worship of him. And there is no runway that can even begin to show the beauty and the glory of what an angel looks like. When we read passages like Isaiah 6 and we see them flying around the throne of God with six wings, it is an amazing sight. You really, it almost would be, that would be a time to go have a trip on LSD, just try to have a little imagination of what it's really like to see an angel. I'm not encouraging you, by the way, to take LSD. All on Christmas morning, that's not a gift. What I'm saying to you is this, though. The angels, the angelic, an encounter with an angel is nothing more than divine intervention. They don't come accidentally. They come with purpose. Mary, you're going to have a child. Joseph, I know that you want to divorce Mary. Marry her because that baby is from God. They come in crisis points. It's beautiful when we see these things happening. And here we see these lowly shepherds, Jesus coming himself in lowly conditions. And now the shepherds are there on the hillside just minding their business, taking care of the sheep. And what takes place? Notice with me. One angel shows up. Just one. Do you see that? Pay attention to your text. An angel of the Lord showing up to him. We don't know who's, who it is. Maybe it's Gabriel again. And it says, the glory of the Lord shone around. They were filled with fear. Every time, look for these words. Fear not. Why? Because you and I, before these angelic beings, are in great fear. The Apostle John in the book of Revelation has encountered an angel, and in that presence, he falls down to his feet in worship, and the angel actually has to say to this, this apostle, get up, I'm not God. And these angelic, where we would sit back and say, how can this be the Son of God? How can he be put in a feeding trough for animals? How can he be garbed in these rags? This is no place for a king. This is no place that the Savior is coming. No. And then with this one lone angel, a host comes to be with him. Now again, we, we need an imagination with these angels. My favorite title for God is actually encountered in a song that we'll sing this coming year as we celebrate the Reformation, the 500th anniversary of it. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. There is uh, this name there, Lord Sabaoth. It's, that's the Hebrew, or we, we translate it as we sing it now. The Lord of hosts, his name. From age to age, the same. That word host is the word that we find here as well. And at this point now, we don't have, you know, Vanity Fair cover scene now with uh, and angels now coming behind another, uh, all the other angels. When you hear the word host, you need to think band of brothers. You need to think of the bad boys. You need to think that underneath their garters, they've got guns and knives and everything else. These are fighting, flaming sword angels like we see in the Garden of Eden. That's who's shown up. That's an angelic host. And what do they do? Glory to God in the highest. There has never been a choir of humans that could touch what was taking place at this point. The praise of the divine, the savior of the world has been born. And they have come to announce his birth. 
and they haven't come to Caesar Augustus. They haven't even come to his tribute, King Herod. They've come to the normal, everyday people, the shepherds. Now you need to think about that for a moment. You go to the Old Testament and you begin to think of this wonderful unfolding of the story and you begin to recognize that so many of those individuals were just lowly shepherds. Abel, he was a tender of the sheep. Abram, leave your country, your family, your kindred, and go, and what does he do? He has to go slowly because of his, his crops or his, his animals that he's taken along with him. And when he gets to the promised land that God's given to him, he's got so many that his nephew Lot and he have to divide off. They're shepherds. God's people are in Egypt in slavery. What takes place? A lowly shepherd on the backside of the desert named Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Later on, there's a king that is set up, and they think as, as Samuel comes to anoint this new king that's going to take place, he's like looking for someone that's head and shoulders tall and beautiful and bold, and what he finds is this scrawny David, the seventh son the boy that was out watching the sheep. The Psalms that David wrote, we are his sheep, people the sheep of his pasture. I don't know about you, but this is a place that we need to just go visit a farm someday. You need to go visit and work with sheep through the year. When I was a kid, we had a few sheep for a while. And we had one that was, um, he didn't bend over with this sheep around in the pen ever. Literally, he loved to come up behind you and knock you over. He got my brother so many times, it was so funny. Uh, I'm like, Scott, you're going to get it, man. You've got your back turned to him. He'd bend over to feed him in the trough and boom. <laughs> sheep are stupid animals. They get that long fur and they get burrs in it and then it gets wet and you want to talk about stinking. These are the people that are touching and caring for the untouchables. You know, recently I just had an experience with the live nativity of re remembering what sheep are like. We had some sheep here and they were coming out of Skip's truck. His friends delivered them here and they were there and they, they, I was standing there and I was just thanking them for allowing us to have their sheep part of the live nativity and they said, would you like to carry one for us? I said, sure, I'd love to. Didn't know I had grown up as a, as a farm boy. I put my arms around that sheep's legs and carried it. You know what that sheep did the very first thing? Pooped down my arm. <laughs> and Jesus... His birth announcement was made to people like that. There was no way that they could ever know that this was not the Son of God because these angels came, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace with those with whom he is pleased. You know, it's not very hard in this story to figure out where you and I are. We are not the angels, okay? Okay. As wonderful as you might think you are, and ladies, someday for those young ladies that are still looking forward to marriage, you know, before you turn bridezilla, please don't do that, by the way, you will be dressed and adorned at the most angelic point of your life. It's glorious. I still remember my wife, Linda, coming down the, the aisle looking so angelic.
What a joy that these shepherds had the presence of angels. The wise men, they got a lousy star. That was amazing if you think about it. The shepherds have a visit of the angels. And I can tell you their lives forever are impacted. What do they do? I want you to see in your text. This understanding, this recognition that Emmanuel has come does a couple things to them. I want you to see after they have this encounter in verse 14 with the angelic voices. And then verse 15, the angels went away from them into heaven. Look what happens. The shepherds look at each other. They say to one another, oh, wasn't that wonderful? You know, we, I wish we would have had a video camera to record that. These guys never needed a video camera to record that. I am so glad they didn't have iPhones back then. It would have missed the glory of it all. What do they do? Hey, that's just amazing. Let's go. We have to see. Let's find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. And so they, they venture out to the city of Bethlehem, to the house of bread. They find Mary and Joseph. They find the baby lying in a manger. And they rejoiced. I want you to see, secondly, verse 17. That was not the end of their celebrations. What they did next was this. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. This is such a, a wonderful experience. It changed their very nature. It changed who they were. And when you and I in encounter the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Emmanuel, we should go away changed and transformed. So much so that it just radiates from us. People see the joy of Christ in us. So much so that people will wonder. Verse 20 continues to tell us about these shepherds. They returned. They went back to their daily grind, their evenings, out in the pasture, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Not only did they have this wonderful saying, we need to go see Jesus, we must see the child, we must come to worship him. Then they went and told, and then they went back to their normal lives, continuing to bring praise and glory to God. You know, we are certainly not Mary and Joseph in the story. We are certainly not the angels in the story. I think the people that we are most like being the sheep of his pasture, the ones that we should say, this is me in the story, the one that we should most be like in response is the shepherds. Our lives need to be changed and transformed. Not because of how wonderful of a shepherd we are, but because we truly have been touched by the Savior. Sometimes our celebrations, if we were to even come close to comparing what we do for Christmas, compared to what truly takes place. If you put commercial Christi Christmas up here, or happy holidays as we like to so often uh, misplace it with, compared to this first Christmas, what we come away with is saying, there is such a travesty, there is such an emptiness, there is such a shallowness to this celebration here, because this is something that just, you know what's so, uh, so amazing? We're going to see Christmas trees out at the trash line this week immediately. It's over with. You know, we got done with it. It's done. I'm so glad for my mom. 
We usually have the Christmas tree up till February. <laughs> I'm not encouraging you necessarily to do that, but it, we, so my mom really enjoyed the s- scent and the smell of the pine in the house, and then it just was like, well, we have all these other things to do, and we just enjoyed it. And then we finally said, okay, it's got to come down. Christmas is something that should be something that we celebrate all day, every day, all of our lives. And we should never lose the wonder that a Savior has come. That we have encountered the Son of God. You know, as we come to this table this morning and we celebrate together the good news that Jesus Christ has come and taken on flesh. We're going to come into this table and recognize he came and took upon himself a body so that his body could be exchanged for our body on the cross. It was our punishment that we were deserving of. And the glory of this goes so much further than just the angelic message. The angelic message was there is a Savior who has come. For us, it goes even further. We can rejoice, and our rejoicing should be greater than the angels because there is no redemption offered to the angels who fell. They are forever condemned. What this table is, those of us the people of God, we have been redeemed because the Son of God took upon himself our flesh and went to the cross on our behalf. As we celebrate Christmas this year, I encourage you to remember my sin bearer has taken my place. I celebrate freely. And angels, you don't have anything on me. I rejoice in you, my Savior. Amen. For those of us that already know Christ, it's not by anything that we have done. We know that. There is nothing, as we come to this table this morning and we walk to it, what we're actually doing is saying, I come naked, without anything to offer the Lord. I have no gift to bring to you. I come simply to you for the gift. By faith, I have been made your child because you did everything in giving me the gift of salvation. And we rejoice as we come to this table. If you're here this morning and have yet to respond to this good news, yet to come to this table, I invite you on this Christmas day to trust Jesus. I invite you to to say, I believe Jesus. You are truly the Son of God. I have life in your name. You simply can cry out to God in your own words. Often we do that in prayer. It doesn't even take prayer to do that. We sometimes confuse that even. It's simply crying out and believing in our heart, God, you have redeemed me, I believe. Please forgive me and be my Savior. And if that's you, I would encourage you on this Christmas day to receive the greatest gift that has been given. I'm really looking forward to this afternoon. There's some pretty cool things that are going to happen in the V2 home. And I'm excited. I know about them. I know what it is. And I know that there's not going to be a present underneath the tree when we get done, except for maybe those we're taking down to Florida in this coming week that we can't open up, but we wish we could still. Because there's just a joy of opening up presents, isn't there? I can't wait for my boys to open up the presents. I could never imagine them sitting back and saying, oh, Mom, I've opened too many presents already. I'm sorry. Um, Can't we just hold off on these until another year? Not going to happen. 
the greatest gift has been offered to us, why would we turn it down? With greater joy than we will see our grandchildren and our children open up those presents, we can come to Jesus Christ in faith and receive the greatest gift. And I welcome you to become part of his people, the sheep of his pasture. Before we come to the table this morning, as we have been doing, I want to give us some time just for personal reflection to, first and foremost, as we come to this table, to celebrate. There is a seriousness to this table of recognizing this is the body and blood of Christ, our Lord. This is what he gave us this to know and remember him. It doesn't save us in any form or fashion, but what it does is we recognize his body was broken for me. His blood was shed for me. As I come to this table, I rejoice, and that's my gift. And so we need to come seriously and solemnly. And if there's anything upon our consciences that grieves God, our sin, maybe sin that we're battling with right now, confess it before you come to this table. Cling to Christ, not to your own self. But also come rejoicing. We've been seeing this sermon series as the series of the friend of God, Theophilus is who this book of Luke is being written to. And this book of Luke is being said, you are the friend of God. We need to recognize in this new year we're going to be celebrating. Jesus has made us the friend of God. We're going to look at what it means to be in union with Christ, to celebrate that we are in him. And he has changed us. So come this morning and rejoice that he has invited you to be part of his family. He has forgiven you. Would you pray with me for a few moments? Oh God, it is with great joy that we celebrate Christmas this morning and we rejoice in Jesus, our Savior. What a privilege it is that you have not only given us yourself, but you have taken our sins. That's the gift that we give to you is our wretchedness. And you take it and you cleanse us, you redeem us, you reconcile us. You make us alive, you renew us, you change and transform us continually. What a joy it is to be your children. So Father, as we come to this table this morning, as we walk forward, as we partake and we say, Lord, I, I need you, I confess, it is not by my works, but by your work upon the cross, I've been saved. God, may you give us your joy, give us your assurance as we feast with you. Renew us, rest restore our joy. Give us the strength that we need through your spirit to, like the shepherds, glorify and praise you. And may you receive all the glory, Jesus. We take and set these simple elements aside, this bread and this cup. May you use them to strengthen and nourish us as your children at this table. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.